for those of you that have been around, uh, you don't need me to explain, but some we have some guests today, so I'll just explain what we've learned is that uh, we all have holes in us, but we have a holy God who comes and moves in our lives, and He makes us whole. And so we're learning a little bit about our holiness with holes, and we're learning a little bit about His holy love for us, and then we're learning about, I, I hope, uh, a little bit about the, the things that many people don't ever stop to consider. Like some people do things and they don't even know why they're doing them. Some people are just, uh, they move all over the place because they, they don't know what to do with their life. Or they jump from job to job or from person to person because they don't understand what's happening on the inside. And God wants to heal and make us whole so we can be the kind of people He designed for us to be. Now, I'm not a mental health professional. I don't claim to be. But I am a student of the Bible so I'm bringing to you what the Bible says about these things. And uh, if mental health professionals acknowledge God and His principles, well then they're probably figuring some things out I haven't figured out. But uh, if I'm going to have a priority, it's to first find out what God says about life. And then if there's some professional who has figured something out, well good. I hope they've discovered some truth too. But if they are discovering things outside of God, I'm not really interested in that. So we want to be biblical. We don't even, we're not even trying to be Pentecostal or Protestant. We want to be biblical. What does the Bible say? So today I have 28 texts and three Bible stories. I'm not going to read all those. But uh, I'm going to be biblical. We should be aware that there's a lot of concepts that are out there that sound like they're from the Bible and they're not really from the Bible. Some of you may have seen this on Facebook. I thought it was good. I don't know if you can read it from back there, but there's, there's uh, five things mentioned here. Five things Jesus did not say. He did not say, follow your heart. He said, follow me. And I put the Bible verse to the right in case you want to look it up. There's 21 of those verses. He did not say to be true to yourself. He said, without wh whoever wants to be my disciple should deny himself. He didn't say believe in yourself. He said, believe in me. He didn't say live your truth. He said, I am the truth. He didn't say as long as you're happy, it's okay. He said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? So one text that we can use is from Romans 15. It says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's kind of what this series is about if we can break the mindsets that we pick up that aren't biblical and we can be biblical, at first your flesh won't like it. Like deny yourself, that doesn't, that doesn't sell very well. But have you ever met somebody who all they wanted to do was make themselves happy and they chased happiness and they made the whole world about them and everybody including themselves, everybody around them including themselves were miserable? Denying yourself is really a pathway to joy. Not denying yourself anything is a way to make yourself miserable and everybody else around you. So, the problem with being whole is you have to buy into God's plan instead of your plan. His philosophy instead of your philosophy. And that's why it's so difficult to go there. So, let's pray again for God's help as we try to go here. God, I pray that you would help everyone in this room, to have a relationship with you, to have that power within them, to help them to live the life that you've called them to live. I pray, Lord, that you would make them whole by your holiness, by your power, by your strength. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we've all got to take care of ourselves. We've got to take care of our spirit. We've got to take care of our mind. We've got to take care of our emotions. And we've got to take care of our physical health. Most people spend most of their time on their physical. Spend more time 
feeding yourself and grooming yourself and looking at yourself in the mirror than you do thinking about your attitude or your, your taking care of your mind, things like that. But it's an ongoing thing. It ever changes. It's never the same. And God can help us with every single part of our being, body, soul, and spirit. He's also put us in families and He's put us in churches so other people can help us take care of ourselves. We take care of each other. And that's a beautiful thing when it works like it's supposed to. God uses other people. But don't tell anybody, we all have issues. I, I got my degree in special education and one of the classes I took was on learning disabilities. And the first day of our class, my professor said, Everybody in this room has a learning disability. Everybody has issues. Everybody's got their thing that they don't get quite right. It might be, you might be the one that's out there in the parking lot trying to find your car. You might have trouble remembering names. You might have trouble talking to strangers. It might be more like trouble hitting a nail with a hammer or setting up a new computer or an iPad. Or doing algebra. Everybody's got their issues that they, they feel like they fall short in. Or they do really not do well. And then there's things that, that are wrong with our bodies. And things that aren't quite the same as everybody else's. And we've, we've come to label them. Like there's OCD people. And there's ADD people. And there's people with a little bit of autism. And there's people that have acne or eczema or arthritis or hormone imbalances or you know I, I don't have to name any more and I hit everybody in this room everybody in this room has issues so we, we try to sometimes identify with other people and so we we oftentimes birds of a feather flock together right so when you're in junior high what do you start doing you start flocking with people like you when I was in junior high there was it was Montana. There were the, the kickers, the cowboys, the guys who wore hats and boots to school. And then there were the jocks, and those, are, you know what they are. And then there were the nerds, and then there were what we call the freaks. Those were the guys experimenting with drugs. And, uh, and, and people were finding their place, but everybody had their strengths and everybody had their weaknesses, and we tend to find people with similar strengths and weaknesses so we can feel good about things. But the truth of the matter is, everybody has a strength or weakness, and God wants to come and help you be healed where He can heal you and learn to live with the things that He doesn't heal in you. He may never heal you of having blue eyes. You might want to have green eyes. But God says, no, Blue's fine. Just, just we're gonna we're gonna live with that one. He may never fix your. You he may have always have a little bit of a, a ADD in you. That might, that might be how you're wired. Well, the only reason you're called that is because other people aren't quite like that. If everybody had, if everybody acted like you, it wouldn't be called anything. So we, we start labeling it when you're a little more this way or a little less this way. And so some of the most peculiar people among us uh, are named names like Einstein or Van Gogh or Beethoven because they're, they're so quirky that they have giftings. And if they can capture those giftings, it can actually be a wonderful thing. And, and the weirdos, many times the geeks, are now the billionaires around the world, right? The, the ones who created the computers and stuff like that. Well, the, those, were the, those were the weirdos. Those were the kids that couldn't kick the football, and they were in their room doing all kinds of math, those nerdy kids. Well, what's wrong with that? It doesn't matter how you're wired. It doesn't matter if you have a quirk. It doesn't matter if you have a leaning. What matters is that you're who God made you to be, and in a way you have to be able to embrace that at some point. And not let your quirkiness define you. You're not an ADD person. You're not an OCD person. You're not a, a geek. Or You are a child of God. And that's, that's who you are. You don't have to define yourself by some label somewhere. Now sometimes labels are helpful in understanding. Okay, I'm probably going to deal with these things. Because everybody that has my issues deals with these things. And there's nothing wrong with understanding that. But labeling yourself... Uh, can be dangerous. 
So the challenge is for me and you to figure out how do I manage my weirdness, my quirks, my hang-ups? What am I supposed to keep? What am I supposed to let go? When do you hold them? When do you fold them? I really don't know sometimes, is this me? Is this God? Is this something I should embrace? Is this something I should let go of? Is this spiritual? Is this physical? Is, can anybody relate to that? You don't always, it's not always easy. It's, it's, it's as simple as this. If I have a co- if I wake up this morning coughing, <coughs> okay, well, there's no easy answer to that. It could be that I have COVID, it could be that I have an ongoing issue with my lungs and that just causes me to cough all the time. I have emphysema. It could be that I have a cold. It could be that the pollen is through the roof and I'm coughing because of that. So we're always trying to figure that out. I'm not sure if it's this. I'm not sure if it's this. And so we troubleshoot a little bit and we do something here or there. We try to we try to solve it however we can and, and try to take a cough drop or dr- drink a water or somehow get rid of the cough, right? You can take that same principle and you can apply it to mental issues, you can apply it to spiritual issues, you can apply it to emotional issues. If I wake up this morning and I have this feeling of loneliness, well, it could be that I had a dream. It could be that I'm really... I'm alone. It could be that I'm just feeling sorry for myself. It could be that it's, it's all just human. It could be that the enemy is trying to make me feel lonely. And it's hard to know which it is. So how do you sort all that out? And, and that's why I named this lesson a balanced biblical approach. Everyone say balanced and biblical. Sometimes it's, it's hard because we're kind of out of our element. Have you ever been in a place where you're out of your element? I, I remember us taking a group of young people to, to Mexico, and we were in a 15-passenger van, and we drove over the border and all the way to Monterey, and none of us knew how to speak Spanish. And it, Monterey has a, a metro area of 4.5 million people. So it's kind of like going to New York City not knowing English. And uh, we stopped at gas stations and no one would talk to us in, in English, although they knew English, I'm pretty sure. Uh, th- we were on their turf now. And it, it was, I was out of my, um, everywhere it was like, does someone want to kill me? What if the police come and throw me in jail? And there's all these fears that come up because I'm out of my element. Or like when we went to London and everyone was driving on the wrong side of the street. It's like everything is backwards here. Nothing is working like it's supposed to work. When we went to Jordan and Egypt, we were on a, a tour where there were policemen in front and behind our bus at times. It makes you a little nervous. You know, what would you do if something happened in Egypt? You don't even know where you're at, and you don't speak their language either. And life feels that way sometimes. You get in a place where you don't know what to do. You feel out of your element. So one technique that people use when they come to places in their life where they're not sure what to do, one thing they could do is they try to find the safest place and take the risk out of life. It's like, if I, if I do these 10 things, am I going to be safe? If so, I'll do these 10 things. And they... they they hope that if they do everything right, that everything's going to be okay. And there's some truth to that. If you do enough good things, if you live by good principles, God will bless that and your life will be good. But you can do absolutely everything the Bible tells you to do, everything God tells you to do, and still die of a disease. You're, you're never going to handle your issues by doing everything perfectly. The only way you can do this is like we've already taught. you got to make him your primary care physician. And you go to him for absolutely everything. I don't know. I'm going to do what I can do today. And if I find out that doesn't work, I'm going to go talk to my primary care physician. If, if I'm trying to be a good person, I'm trying to get over my anger issues, and I, 
and I get angry. Oh, I didn't mean to. I'm just going to go talk to my primary care physician, my, my counselor, my comforter. Everything goes back to that. If you don't have a relationship with God, if you're trying to get there by drinking herbal tea and by going on long walks and by having dogs or whatever it is you try to, to get a handle on things, none of those things will really work. All those things might help a little bit, but the only thing that really works is I got to get whole. I got to get in this relationship with God. So I keep coming back to that because that's the core of everything. But if God has been unsettling something in your life, you're going to try to get your balance somewhere. And if you don't get it in Him, you might get it in a philosophy or, a, you know, a, a coping mechanism of some kind. So we're left as Christians trying to distinguish what am I supposed to do, what, what does God do, and what do I do, and what's right and what's wrong. And, and sometimes there's some of our brains that work this way. i got to figure it all out, and then I'll be okay. And the problem is, you never figure it all out. Can I get an Amen. Everybody in this room has issues and everybody is compensating for something somehow, somewhere. And if you can get God to give you real help, then you're not just coping anymore. You're dealing with it. So it gets a little dicier and a little harder when it comes to emotional and mental issues. Because we don't understand our, our head and our heart sometimes. And it's kind of hard to tell the difference between what God is saying and what I think He's saying and what this person's saying. And I sometimes have a hard time telling if I'm feeling loved or if I'm feeling hated or if I'm feeling. Can, can I get a witness again? Does anybody have a harder time with your heart and your mind than you do your body? But it's just as hard. So. We're going to start today with the spiritual side of things, all right? Because the spiritual spirit world acts on your mind, your will, your emotions, your body, and it affects all of those things. So we're going to consider that, and we're going to get to the other things later. But I want to start by, by looking at what the Bible does not say about spiritual issues, okay? All things are spiritual, is not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't teach, it, it doesn't say that everything is spiritual. Like, if I get up in the morning and I don't feel like Wheaties, that, that's not necessarily the voice of God telling me not to eat Wheaties. Not everything is spiritual. If I get up in the morning and, and everybody in the room seems angry, that could be spiritual, but it's not necessary. it's not always spiritual. We're going to be balanced here, all right? Because there's some people that they want to they want to put a spiritual thing on everything. Well, my boss, uh, the devil's using her. She just doesn't love me. She doesn't care. Well, did you get there on time? No. Uh, well, are you doing your work? No. But the devil's using her. Well, you're copping out. You're you're making everything spiritual that way. The balance is there are spiritual things, but then there's just everyday practical things. So sometimes Christians can be accused of being so heavenly minded they're no earthly good because they want to make everything spiritual. But other people are so anti, they don't understand the spirit world, so nothing is spiritual and they want to make everything physical. We're going to be balanced. There, there are some chemical imbalances that make people act weird. There are some traumas that happen that, that make people uh, deal with, you know, there are some people that have memory loss and that's not necessarily spiritual. There are some people that have uh, uh, nervousness, anxiety, and that may not be spiritual. That might just be a physical thing that's happening in their body. They may have some kind of a, a physical ailment. The Bible doesn't say that if we struggle with things, we're bad. Or that we need more faith. Like if there's someone in this room who's had diabetes for 20 years and you've prayed a dozen times for God to heal your diabetes and God has not healed your diabetes, the Bible doesn't say that you don't have faith just because you have diabetes. The, the, it doesn't teach that our emotional and our mental health issues negate our salvation. Just because I don't 
feel happy doesn't mean I'm not saved. Every time you're dealing with, maybe you're you're going through a dark time where it's been three weeks and you can't even feel good about anything. That does not mean you're not saved. That means there's probably a mental or an emotional thing or maybe a physical thing that's going on in your body. But salvation is a different issue. You're saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been washed in that blood. You've taken on His his grace. that's, That's settled. doesn't matter if you feel bad today. The Bible doesn't teach us that we can't take medicine. And the Bible doesn't teach us that we can't get help from professionals. That's not what the Bible says. So everybody knows where I stand. I'm not against doctors. I'm not against medicine. I'm not against psychiatrists. I'm not against psychologists. What I'm against is when God is not the primary one. If a doctor doesn't believe in God, I'm a little hesitant. I might let him, you know, work on my teeth. I might let him fix my broken leg. But I, I'm not sure if he doesn't believe in God that I'm going to trust him very much because he might not feel like it's wrong to kill babies. He might not feel like it's wrong to do euthanasia because he doesn't have the mind, the world view that the Bible gives. And especially when it gets into mental and emotional health care professionals. If, if you go to someone who is not... Bible-based, who is not God-based, and you give your heart and your mind over to them, you're opening up this can of worms. They could be, they could be doing anything. They could be doing voodoo, voodoo in there with you, trying to fix you. There's a lot of different ways people try to fix emotional, mental, and spiritual things. And so it's very important, if you get help, that you don't, you don't just go get help from anybody. You don't go to the closest neighbor and say, I need heart surgery, that guy's going to cost me $500,000. How much will you do it for? <laughs> well, I've never been trained for it. Yeah, but how much will you do it for? You'll do it cheap, right? We could use your bedroom. You got a good, sharp kitchen knife. We, we could, uh, you know, we could, do, we could do Google. We could Google this thing, and you could do this heart surgery on me. No. What the Bible does say the Bible talks about a lot of things. The Bible talks about dinosaurs. The Bible talks about ghosts and demons. It talks about life after death. It talks about time travel. It talks about translation. There's a lot of things, spiritual things, that we don't understand. The Bible tells about God moving one person from here to here. He talks about Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead and walking through walls. I can't explain all of that. But Hollywood doesn't have anything on the Bible. And God understands this more than we do. So I, I can trust the Bible. The Bible will help me understand the spiritual world, but I'm never going to understand all the spiritual world. The Bible tells me I'm going to heaven, but my brain can't really understand heaven. I don't understand how I can be changed from a mortal to an immortal person. I, I don't know how I'm going to be caught up in the air to meet him. I don't understand that scientifically, but I know Jesus did that, and we, we know because he did it, we're going to be able to do that. And, and so it, it can help me understand spiritual things. So we're going to look at three stories real quickly that help us understand the spiritual world. The first one is in 1 Samuel, and there's dozens of these stories, but in 1 Samuel... Uh, it talks about King Saul. And it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. So the Bible teaches that there are spirits that can come fill you with depression and fear. Now you might have fear, like if you, if you tried to pet a dog when you were three and he bit you, you might always be afraid of dogs. That might just be a little bit of healthy respect for what a dog can do to you. That's not necessarily the spirit of fear. But there is a spirit of fear that can fill you. And so what Saul used to do is he would send for uh, someone who knew how to worship. He sent for David, and David came and sang and played a harp, and that helped Saul let go of that fear and believe in God a little bit, and it gave him some relief. But that was a spiritual thing that was happening. It wasn't a physical thing that was happening. Saul became depressed because Saul had disobeyed God. So if, if you're dealing with fear or whatever, the first thing you do is double check, am I right with God? 
If I'm right with God, then there may be something else He can help me with. But, but a lot of times, the reason we have issues is because we're not right with God. We're trying to live life our way instead of God's way. The second story comes from Jesus' ministry. It's the story of the demoniac. It says, when they arrived at the other side of the lake in the region of Gerasim, when Jesus climbed out of the boat, a man possessed by an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. So the Bible teaches you can be possessed. This man lived in the burial caves and could no longer be restrained even with a chain. So the Bible teaches that there's some supernatural strength that can come with demon possession. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as often he was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves in the, in the hills, howling and cutting himself. People who have cutting issues, sometimes it's a spiritual thing. With sharp stones. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to meet him, bowed low before him. With a shriek, he screamed, why are you interfering with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. So the Bible teaches that when somebody, Jesus, has authority over these principalities and powers, they're afraid of Him. Basically, you and I need to believe there's devils out there. But if we're right with God, they should be scared of us rather than us being scared of them. You with me? Am I being biblical? For Jesus had already said to the spirit, come out of the man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus demanded, what's your name? And he replied, this was not the man, this was the spirit. My name is Legion because there are many of us inside this man. Then the evil spirits begged him again and again not to send them to some distant place. There happened to be a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside nearby. Send us into those pigs, the spirits begged. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission. The evil spirits came out of the man, entered the pigs, and the entire herd of about 2,000 pigs plunged down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned in the water. So the Bible teaches that spirits can live in animals. Thing is, God made life. The devil doesn't have the power to do that. He hijacks. So if he can find an animal or a person to live in, He'll try to do that because that's how he gets his power. So he knocks on your door and says, hey, how about just uh, buying that little Ouija board and going home and playing with it? Ah, it's just a game. Well, let's open up to this. Let's see if it answers my questions. And you open your spirit, you open a door, and a spirit comes in. It can happen. Well, don't get spooky on us. Don't get a Ouija board. Well, do I have to be afraid? No, you don't have to be afraid. If, if you're his uh, and you encounter a spirit or something tries to come, if, if God has you, if you have given yourself to God, there's no room for anything else. But if you're, t you're, you're tempted, you know, you're a little open to, well, I love Jesus, but I kind of like some of the new age stuff too. So I pray, but then I get my crystals out and I... I, I do, I, I dabble in this, that's why we have to be careful. There's, for example, there's some physical things that help us, like rub a little bit of lotion on your hands, and that's nice. You know, a little bit of oils, for example, they can be helpful. But I've seen people take oils to the place where they, they suddenly think these oils are going to make prayer more powerful. Well, that's, that's crossing a the line there. I might, I might have an air freshener. I might put some oils out so I can enjoy it, especially at Christmas time. I like cinnamon and I like... Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Unless, unless every morning you need your cinnamon oil so you can stop shaking. Now, now you're trusting in something besides God. Balance. So if God's in charge of my life, I don't have to be afraid of these devils. But that really happens. Mental illness can be demonic. But not all mental illness is demonic. This is balance. There can be multiple demons in a person. Legion in, that old, in, in this language, as it was written, could mean as many as 2,000 devils in one man. So that happens. But we don't have to freak out because Jesus is in the room. When we come to church, there are times when... the 
There, there might be spirits. It could be as simple as a spirit of heaviness. It could be a spirit of rebellion. It could be a spirit of selfishness. If you've ever come to church and you've really had trouble worshiping, something either physically, maybe mental, but maybe spiritual is trying to shut you down. You're not necessarily possessed, but something's trying to get you mad or something's trying to get you crossways with God or something's trying to get you to stop going to church. That's spiritual. You don't have to be afraid of that. The more you know God, the more He opens your eyes to things and the more He gives you authority over those things. And then the third story is King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4. Twelve months later, this king began to take a walk on a flat roof. He'd, he'd had a very good run. His, his kingdom was going good. He was taking a walk on a flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. He looked out across the city and he said, Look at this great city of Babylon, my own mighty power. I have built this beautiful city as, as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. And while these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You're no longer ruler of the kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time or years will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That same hour, the judgment was fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So there are spiritual things that explain why some people go stark raving mad. Again, we don't have to be afraid of that. But whenever you feel something that doesn't feel like God, move a little closer to God. Whenever you notice that there's, there's no joy in your house, go back into more devotions and more worship and more praise. It's not like you have to be scared stiff of everything. Just like in real life. You know there are diseases out there. Botulism. There's botulism somewhere in town, some can somewhere. Could kill everybody in this room. And, and we could get all spooky about this. There could be a terrorist group in Connecticut somewhere. and It's very true. It could be. And we could all start living like terror is everywhere. Or we can be aware, you know what, that could happen. But let's try to keep democracy alive. Let's just try to, let's try to fan the good things. Let's try to have law and order. And, and those things will be kept at bay. But, but I can't live in fear of all those things. So if there are devils that could possess me, if there are devils that could make me go stark raving mad, I, and I wake up in the middle of the night and I think one's in my room, the answer is always Jesus. I'm just going to talk to Jesus for a while. I'm just going to invite the presence of God in this room for a while. I don't know what this is. I don't, I don't know if it's imagined. I don't know if it's real. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to fight it the same way. If I got a cold, I don't know what it is. I'm just going to take care of myself every way I know how. And I'm, I'm not going to go look at all the reasons I'm probably coughing. Because you can really get deep in those weeds. You can suddenly have cancer because you had a cough. And you, know, you, you hacked a couple times, now you have cancer. What are you going to do? What, what's going to happen to your kids? What's going to happen to your house? And you can live in all that kind of fear. Or in balance, you can say, I had a cough. Probably drink a little drink here. Maybe take a little honey and maybe, maybe do whatever little thing I can to fix this cough. But I don't have to be afraid. So there's a spiritual world. And the enemy wants to come in and he's trying to get our whole society to let down its walls. And so now, in our society, it's weird to raise your hands and worship God. But it's not weird to do it for Lady Gaga. In our society, it's weird to shout, Hallelujah, glory to God. But it's not weird to shout, Go Yankees! In our society, it's weird to talk in tongues. But it's not weird to go to the fair and let some lady look into a ball and tell me a little bit about the future. Right? So we got to figure this thing out. I want to be biblical. I want to do it God's way. I, there is a spirit world. But the, the devil, he, he hijacks everything he can hijack. So the Bible makes us aware of these things. And it helps us to kind of make our way through the minefield of life. 
There's different things that open us up to things, like fads. There's, there's been a fad, like the 60s fad, everybody sleep with everybody. Well, that opened to a spirit not only of lust, but of fornication, and then broken families, and then murder and stuff like that that comes out of bad relationships. There are attitudes that sweep the country. Attitudes of political division, for example, make everybody mad at everybody else. Those are not always just human. Those can be spiritually motivated. And there can be all kinds of junk that comes out of that. And then there's wounds in our life and hurts in our life. And just like if you had a, a bum leg because you broke it in, uh, in your teens. And every time it gets cold, you start having pain in that leg. That happens in your soul. That happens in your mind. That happens in your emotions. Somebody hurts you years ago, and it might even be healed, but it's still, there's still that, whenever Christmas comes around, whenever that person comes around, you start feeling those things again. What do I do with that? Well, if, if my bum leg is bothering me, I probably figure out ways to go stretch it or, or maybe get out of the cold or s- something to deal with it. And if I have these emotional and spiritual things, I go talk to my primary care physician. And I say, God, would you just completely heal me of that or at least help me know how to deal with that? Balanced and biblical. Everyone say balanced and biblical. So I, I hate to disappoint you, but I don't have any pixie dust to throw at this. And there's no, uh, there's no mystical thing that I can tell you. The devil's used things for years, age-old tricks. There's spirits that have ruled the earth for years, mysticism. And in Rome, there were orgies. Like some young people think that they came up with the idea and threesomes and foursomes are... Are, are cutting edge. No, that, that was happening way, 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 way back ever since mankind first got evil. Murder and chemicals. You know, uh, maybe the names change and the combinations change from crack to heroin to whatever, but the, the American Indians had stuff like that. Chinese have had stuff like that for years and years and years. So, you and I are just dealing with stuff that's been around a long time. All, we don't need to figure it all out. We don't need to understand everything. We just need to, to test everything and make sure we stick with what God has given us. So I'm just going to give you six things to think about. This was something I borrowed from a, a, a minister named Stephen Waterhouse who, who deals with uh, demons. And here's his observations. And this was helpful to me. I hope it's helpful to you. If I'm trying to decide, is this spiritual and demonic? Or is this just mental illness? Or is it just uh, emotional disruption or whatever? This is one way I can tell. Demons speak in rational dialogue. People with disorders are irrational. Demons don't want anything to do with Christ. People with disorders obsess with God and religion. In fact, a lot of people with mental illness, that they're not possessed by a devil, there's just something wrong in their head. They sometimes get into the Bible in really weird ways. And the enemy then uses that to make people think anybody who's into the Bible is weird. So if a movie wants to make you freak out, they show somebody in this room with all these candles and they're, they're quoting all kinds of re- scriptures that you all, almost never hear anything about and they're doing all kinds of weird things. Demons give supernatural knowledge to their hosts, but people with illness only know the facts that they gain through learning. Demons want to hide. Mentally ill people want to be noticed and may even claim demon possession. Demonic phenomenon is scary and spooky. Mentally ill people don't have supernatural strength or knowledge. They just have faulty thinking. Six, demons cannot be cured with medicine. Mental illness can be cured or, uh, excuse me, mental, mental illness can't be cured with exorcism. So, 
if I'm not sure, I might need somebody to help me figure that out. There's spiritual advisors. There's people who have experience with this. There's maybe even people who have experience with medications and mental illness. But it's not all black and white and it's not all easy. The balance is, if I'm God's, He's going to help me figure this out some way. So here's some guiding principles. You can't fix spiritual problems with physical solutions. Okay? If I am angry because I have not forgiven someone, the only solution to that is forgiveness. If I refuse to forgive and I am angry and I drink Red Bull to get over it, it's not going to fix it. If I switch partners because no one can live with me, it doesn't fix it. If I try to fix this spiritual issue with a physical thing, maybe a, a discipline of some kind, a mantra of some kind, I might get a little relief, but it doesn't really fix it. So if I have a spiritual issue, I, I need to fix it spiritually, not some gimmick way. So that's why I spend a lot of time with God, so He can reveal my heart, so He can talk to me about what I'm feeling. If prayer solves this problem, then it probably wasn't a physical issue, it was probably a spiritual issue. If I am angry, or let's say I'm lethargic, I get up and I'm just tired, I, am just, I can't get over my tiredness. Well, did I go to sleep on time? Am I, is my blood sugar high? Could be a lot of things making me tired. It could be I'm tired just because I'm emotionally bound up or something. So first thing I do is I get up and I start praying. I talk to God. God, I love you. I need your blood. I need your love. And, you know, if after 10 minutes of prayer I'm not tired anymore, it was probably an emotional or spiritual thing that was, was taken care of in prayer. I, 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 I solve it just by spending time with Jesus. If, if medicine helps to alleviate a problem, then it's probably not demon possession. So if I'm not sure, I, I first talk to God about it and try to deal with it spiritually. And, and if, if I have this migraine all the time, it, it might just be a physical thing. I might have to try to deal with it with some kind of a painkiller or whatever while I pray for physical healing. That's balance. I don't know if God's going to heal me. I don't know if I'm going to have to take Tylenol. But I, I'm going to do God first. And if God doesn't fix it, then I'll, I'll manage what I have to manage. Second thing to keep in mind is that God heals and He delivers. Peter just told me that he went to his doctor and his doctor had him in the office and for like 25 minutes he was looking at the computer and finally he turned to Peter and he said, Peter, I don't know what's happening. What are you doing? Your numbers were way up and now they're down. I, I, what are you doing? Peter said he just pointed to heaven. And the doctor said, you're a miracle, Peter. Just go. God heals. But that doesn't mean He heals everything right away all the time. That's balance. Jesus protects us from possession, but not from oppression or sickness. In other words, because I've given my heart to God, there's not room for the devil there. But the devil will still knock on my door. And sickness will still come. And I will still deal with a lot of things in life. But... I don't have to be afraid that he's gonna, the devil's going to come and possess me if I'm giving my heart to God. That's balance. Would you stand? I know this has been a little different, but I'd like to invite you to the front. And I'd like to, to end how we started in pre-service prayer. We need to pray that God would give us authority over anything that we're dealing with. And if some of you have had long-term addictions, if you've had issues in your marriage for 20 years, if you have been angry for 20 years, if you have, if you have a physical issue that you, you, you think it's physical but you don't know, or maybe it, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes because uh, if you have an ulcer, that's a physical thing. But sometimes the reason you have that ulcer is because there was stress in your life that made your body create that ulcer. So 
that's not all physical. It's also emotional and maybe a little bit of spiritual there. Well, Brother Hanson, you're not helping me. You just made it muddier. Beware of anyone who comes along with simple answers. It's not always this. It's not always that. It's not like if you're a Christian, you never deal with that. It's not like if you're dealing with that, you're not a Christian. It's a lot more complicated than that. But there's nothing to be afraid of. Finding balance. Again, would you say balance? Finding balance is always harder. People will gravitate to itches. You see this in politics most clearly. You, you either got the ultra right or the ultra left. Can anybody be in the middle anymore? Why do you be, you got to be irate and mad and, and killing and destroying and tearing things up because of this or way over here because of this. Why can't you just talk in the middle? Why can't we just solve this in the middle somewhere? Christians can do that. It seems easier to either be really dogmatic or not believe anything. So there's the Christians that's like, boy, I believe this, this, and this, and everybody else is wrong, and I'm right. And then you got people over here, well, Jesus loves everybody, and it doesn't really matter what you believe. And then there's balance in the middle somewhere. It doesn't matter what you believe, but no one's got it all figured out. We all need Jesus. We can, we can be in love with, with our church and our doctrine and find a, a safe haven there. But that's, that, that's only for the immature. The more mature you get, the more you get to where you're not hiding in your church, you're not hiding in your doctrine, you're in Christ. Neither do you just follow your heart over here. Like, okay, I don't have to believe anything and my doctrine's not important. I just follow my heart. No, there's a balance here. The balance is there's doctrine that gives me direction and God talks to me through my heart and when I bring all that together, I find balance in my life. Not everything is physical. Not everything is spiritual. Life is some of both. We are the collision of two worlds. You are someone who's going to live forever. You are a spirit being. But you're living in a body that has warts and bunions and bad ligaments and stinky feet. What do we do? Do we go into the prayer room and pray that God would take our stink away from our feet? No. We wash our feet. But when I have anger... When I have anxiety, when I have a spiritual issue, I'm going to go to the prayer room and I'm going to take care of it there. Why? Because that's my spiritual man that needs to be taken care of. I'm going to take care of my physical man. I'm going to take care of my spiritual man. I'm going to be balanced in there. I'm going to do both of those things. And I have to ask God for discernment. What's physical? What's emotional? What's spiritual? What, what, what's what? I need His help because it's not so clear. Anybody who comes to you telling you they could figure your problems out and just tell you everything that's wrong with you, Run. Finding balance is always harder. And some of the greatest work in prayer is allowing God to help us figure these things out by sifting our motives and our attitudes. So, let's, let's go back to the illustration of unforgiveness. Let's say I have unforgiveness in my heart and I'm just mad all the time. Life is not fair. I'm a little mad at the person who hurt me. I'm a little mad at God for letting the person hurt me. A little bit bitter at a person, a little bit bitter at God. Don't always recognize it, but I'm just a bitter person. I'm just a grouchy, angry person. Well, what do I do? I spend some time with my counselor. I spend some time with my comforter. I, I talk to him in prayer. God, why am I so mad all the time? I've tried not to be so angry. I just blew up at nothing. You know, the, the, the kids spit up and I got mad. Why? Why should I get mad? Kids spit up. That's what happened. I, I spilled a glass of milk and I said, 
stupid idiot, you ought to just go away. Nobody loves you anymore. That was just a glass of milk. Why'd you get so upset over a glass of milk? God, why did I get so upset over a glass of milk? Lord, I want to be more whole. I want you to heal this. Now, if I'm too busy to have devotions, I skip the counseling session and I get, I'm mad all day. So I stop at the, the watering hole on the way home to deal with my anger and I complicate issues because I didn't have time to pray. I didn't have time to go to the counselor. I didn't have time to go find balance. I didn't have time to let God sift my motives. I'm mad, and if I'm mad at somebody, it's got to be their fault. I didn't have time to ask God, am I mad because I have a bad attitude? Search me, O Lord, and know my heart, the psalm says. Try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. God, look at my heart. And why, why, Brother Hanson, do you always bring us to the front? I hate coming to the front. Me too. That's, flesh hates it. Why do we do that? We're, we're dragging our carcass down to the altar and we're, we're kneeling before God or we're standing before Him and saying, God, coming to you because if there's a problem in life, it's probably not as much about other people as I think it is because if I have joy, nobody can take that away from me. If I have peace, nobody can take that away from me. If, if I'm letting something take my joy and peace away from me, then I can probably get healed in prayer. I'm going to talk to you about that and you're going to give me understanding. I'm going to come to the altar. I've been coming to the altar for 50 years. I'm going to come again because this is where I find my motives sifted. This is where God, He, he, he lets healing flow. This is where angels move and, and touch and, and do spiritual things. This is when I speak in tongues. A lot of times the Bible says I'm edifying myself. I'm saying things I don't even know I'm saying. I'm dealing with issues I don't even know I'm dealing with. And my brain doesn't understand this. But it's a spiritual thing. God takes care of it. I don't know how many things He's taking care of in my life that I have no clue was taken care of. But I'm going to keep coming into His presence and I'm going to keep worshiping Him with all my heart and I'm going to keep letting His Spirit flow through me because so much healing happens there. And the greatest work of prayer is not praying for Aunt Susie's toe and Uncle, Uncle Joe's restaurant that's about to go under. The greatest thing you can do is prayer and prayers is searching your own heart and letting God help you with your motives and then praying for the attitudes and spirits of our society and our world, the things that are destroying people, the spirit of murder, the spirit of division, the spirit of, of depression that's out there looking for vessels to come and fact. That's where prayer could be powerful. The Bible says don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. So this is what I want us to do. This is just one way we can do it, one way you can do it. I'd like us to sing for our altar time today. I'd like the praise team just to lead us in a song, just like when David played for Saul. In fact, one time Elisha was trying to get a prophecy and he couldn't get a prophecy, so he called for a musician. And the musician came and played and provided an atmosphere where he could open his heart and begin to prophesy. So right now, don't try to figure any of this out. You'll notice I didn't give you pat answers. All I understand about all of you is that you need Jesus. Everybody's got issues and he is the great physician. Every, everybody's got issues and he's the counselor. If I can just get you to go to the counselor, everybody's problems are solved. Some of it's spiritual, some of it's physical. Sometimes we've, we've prayed for things. My, my wife has had several health issues that she prayed about and someone came along with, with physical solutions that helped her manage her body and fix that health situation. God didn't just take it away. He led her to a better diet or a different, you know, taking care of the body differently. Sometimes it's not, it's not even a, a disease. It's just manage your body differently. Sometimes if you can't get out of bed for a long time, it could just be a physical issue that God can give you a solution to. He might use a doctor to do that. He might use Google to do that. But go to the great physician. And if you're ever stuck, turn some praise music on. Just go into His presence. The Bible says we come into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Just come into His gates 
come into his throne room and say, I don't know, I don't understand nothing. I don't understand the spirit world. I don't understand my body. I don't understand my mind. I, I, but I understand this. You are sovereign and you know everything. And I'm, I'm just going to take a break from all that. And I'm just going to come into your presence where there's fullness of joy. I'm going to come and remind myself that you're above everything. and You have all power. And Lord, you're, these things that are, you're bringing up in my life, you're not bringing them up to torture me. You're bringing them up because you're going to reveal some things. You're going to heal some things. So I'm going to back off for a minute and not freak out. Whatever's in my life right now, you're using it to work things together for good. It's going to be okay. Even, even if I'm upset and uncomfortable, even if some things have happened that I don't understand, I trust you anyway. And the way I can get into that place, that mindset is to just get into worship. Forget everything else and just worship Him. Would you go there with me for a few minutes with the praise team? Let's go into His presence for a few minutes. I have so much trust in God that we come together and we just let God have His way. We're not going to turn into every service we're looking for devils and I'm going to call out devils. But there's going to be deliverances more than there already has been. Lives change. How does that happen? Well, let me give you a quick example. We were in the auditorium when it was in what's now the fellowship hall. And there was a service where it was altar call much like this. And there was a guest that had been coming for a few months had a lot of issues, had drug issues and had family issues. So I knew he had issues from that kind of thing. But I was just walking down the steps. He was standing about where Dennis was standing. I walked like this just down the steps. He had his eyes closed. He didn't even know I was here. And as I, I began to step down here, he was, he was standing there with his eyes closed and he, he just shuddered like this and moved away from me. Like, like flinched and I thought, that's weird. I don't know what's happening there. Again, he, I hadn't talked to him. He didn't know I was there. He had his eyes closed. I came up. I went and prayed for a few people, came back by. And when I got close to him, he did that again. I, I don't know what he was feeling. I don't know if it was angels. I don't know if it was authority. I don't know what it was. But it just showed me that if, if I have God in me, it's God that affects all that. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to try to cast devils out. But God might use me to do that. It's not going to be spooky. We're not going to use grease and, and powder and cutting and ceremonies and holy water and all that kind of stuff. It's just the power of Almighty God. It's the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And we don't have to start looking at the spirit world and trying to figure it all out and trying to be super spiritual and super powerful. We just need to love Jesus and love people and do, let Him have His way in our services. And when He does, there won't be room for that kind of stuff. That, that kind of stuff will just be pushed out. Perfect love cast out all fear. The more God moves, and the more you love people, pray for people, the more you speak faith into people's life, the more you help people. If they have a devil, God can just take it and no one even knows about it. If it's more dramatic than that, He can take care of that too. We don't have to chase that. We don't have to try to be super spiritual. We just know God's going to do that. He's going to do that in a greater measure than He's ever done that before. And, and He's going to use you to do that. Brother Hanson, there's a spirit of heaviness in our house. What do I do? Well, you know, you can pray in your house. You can anoint with oil. And sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes God has people do that. But the best way for you to get heaviness out of your house is for you to get authority over in your own spirit. And you to bring a little, you know, light a candle instead of cursing the darkness. And let the joy of the Lord spill out of you. And when your kids are all grouchy, but you stay happy, before you know it, they can't help it, and they're probably going to be a little happier. And I know that's not as spiritual, and that's not as spooky as, in Jesus' name, depression, leave my home. But if you will let God change your attitude, that's how He moves the Spirit out. That's how He displaces it. Pray too, yes. Pray in Jesus' name, yes. But... We're not going to save New England by walking the streets and just saying in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We'll do that. We'll have our prayer times. But, but, but that's a lot. Sometimes it's a cop-out. I could pray against the spirit of, of bitterness and not deal with my own bitterness. 
And it, it feels more powerful to get up and say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke bitterness. Get out of here, bitterness. In Jesus' name. Jesus. And sometimes that's not even faith, that's fear. I'm saying it really loud because I want it to get out of there. But if I have fear in my heart, or if I have issues in my heart, and I've, I've gone to prayer, I've done the work of sifting, I've done the work of every day making sure my heart is right, then, then I overcome that. My, my very presence is joy and love and peace. The fruit of the Spirit is just spilling out of my life. And that's how, that's how God takes over. There'll be a time or two when maybe something's rebuked. There'll be a time or two when something is, happens in the service that's, that's really dramatic. But most of what God does is on a daily basis when He gives you authority over this and authority over that. So I'd like us to close by one more prayer as we started. I want us to praise God for the way He's going to transform our lives and our region and our nation. I don't know how it's going to happen. I've stopped trying to figure all that out. But God said He's going to do it. I don't know how He's going to do it. But God, I want, I want you to do it and I believe you're going to do it. And you're, you're not, I don't need to figure it out in order for you to do it. I have no clue. I don't know how you parted the sea. I don't know how you made walls fall down. I don't know how you made axes float. I don't know how. We, we can't explain any of that, but we know He did it. And we know we're with Him. And we know He's with us. So let's just praise Him for the things that He's brought up in your life that you have no clue how you're going to fix. But you know who will fix them. Worship the God who's going to help you with this reoccurring addiction. Worship the God who's going to help you with this marriage issue that keeps coming up. Worship God instead of focusing on the problem, worrying about the problem, trying to understand the problem. Focus on the God who's going to give you understanding. Focus on the God who's going to give you breakthroughs and victories. Can we thank Him that way? Can we praise Him right now? Let's give Him a hand clap and a praise for what He's going to do. I love you, God. I thank you for what you're going to accomplish. I thank you for how you're going to change our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the victory and the authority you're going to give us.